So we are, yeah. It tells me, James is recording the call. Yeah, okay, so we've started. So, um, good morning, afternoon, or good evening to everybody that's watching this. I am joined today by the legendary Brian of London. Um, so, yeah, just a quick introduction to the audience. I mean, I'm sure the audience already know you anyway. But, but <laughs> Most yeah. of the audience do, yeah. Okay, I'm Brian of London, and I am, of course, not in London anymore. I'll just tell you where the name comes from. In 2004 or five, I was in America. I was at a conference and I got talking to a radio host. She said, come on her show later. So I went on her show and I realized I was about to talk about uh, stuff like Islam that would get me in trouble back in the UK. She said, what's your name? Just before we went on air. And, and, I, and I like, um, and on, I, oh, I don't want to give my full name because my employers will get it. So I, I came with my middle name, which is genuinely brian and she said and she then just called me brian of london and then the last question i asked her before we went live was how many people are listening and she just like waved and said you don't need to know and then after we come off the air i said how many people were listening she said it's a saturday show not very many three four million tops <laughs> that's, that's anyway some audience isn't it so so that's how the brian of london name came about and by the time i left England, which was in 2000. I started leaving in 2007 and I got to Israel in 2009. Long story. Um, I was known as Brian of London in activist circles. So I kept it because as I keep saying to the, um, this is how I test Christians. Okay. Whether they have a sense of humor, you're a Christian, right, James? Yeah. Okay. So I say, just as Jesus is no longer in Nazareth, Brian is no longer in London. <laughs> I like and, it, and, and that's the point. And you know what? The, the, the really hardcore evangelical Americans get a bit, sometimes a bit upset because they say you've compared yourself to Jesus. Uh, but most people see that it's. Yeah, but it's a, it's a friendly comparison, isn't it? It's not that you're not like, you're not. I'm not. Jesus exactly. Or like that. It's just literally comparing the fact that you're no longer, no, you're no longer in London. And yeah. this was obviously no longer in Nazareth. But I am um, of London. I grew up in London. My, you know, I, 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 let's let's just lay it all out because it's all out there on the um, Daily Stormer. I'll correct the record, shall I? <laughs> yeah. So if you're um, if you're a London boy, does that mean you're a Spurs yeah. fan like myself? A what? No. Well, you know what? I, okay, we can get into this identity thing. I was born in South Africa. I moved yeah. with my parents to England when I was 18 months old. So I never learned to talk like a South African, you know, except by hearing relatives and when I used to go back. So I can talk like a South African, but I, I'm not South African. And, and I renounced my citizenship, actually, in, uh, when I turned 17 and they called me up for the army. This was the old South Africa. They called me up to go fight blacks in uh, Namibia. And I said no. <laughs> and, uh, and I sent them my passport. I just mailed it to them. Uh, so that's the extent of my South African. But I grew up in Britain. Am I a Spurs fan? You know what? I never really was a football fan. I was more cricket and rugby. Okay. Um, you know, I went to a public school. What can I say? It just, football was the louts. You know, rugby is, <laughs> rugby is the louts game played by... Uh, Bugs. Played by thugs and, and football. Which, what, what is it? I don't know. Oh, football is the, the gentleman's game played what, by... By folks, yeah. I, I've heard that comparison a few times over the years. My family are big fans as well. Um, so what's, what's it, what made you move over to Israel? Okay. Well, I got married uh, to an Israeli woman uh, in 2000, and she came to live in England with me. And we lived for a while without having kids. But then we had our first child, and I had already, you know, in 2001, I'm one of these people who started taking a much harder look at Islam in 2001. 2001, 9-11, everybody, you know, yeah. my father went out and bought the Quran. I went out and read the Quran. We both started talking about it. We read a bunch of books. And in fact, one of the first books I read was Why I Am Not a Muslim by um, Ibn Warak, uh, which is a pseudonym. But he's a Pakistani born ex-Muslim and he is not a Muslim uh, <laughs> anymore. And that book was a, was was a re, was revelatory because it really it really laid out the fundamental differences between Islam and 
Judaism and Christianity. I firmly see Judaism and Christianity as paired, you know, that they share so much. And I'm much, I'm much happier talking with Christians about the common roots. Yeah. Whereas Islam seems to be an inversion, but we, we can get on to that later. So anyway, so I, I looked at all what, what was going on in the UK and I looked at the prospects of bringing up Jewish children, but not in a really religious way. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not really observant. I have a huge, deep cultural attachment uh, to being Jewish and the values of being Jewish and some of the ceremonial stuff and having a Friday night Shabbat dinner with the family, all of that kind of stuff. But I'm not like overly careful about eating kosher and I'm not, and I, and I break the Sabbath rules by driving but I'm respectful of the traditions and I'm and I'm as I've grown, grown older, I've got deeper into what those traditions have achieved for the Jewish people. And and I think a lot of this, you know, Christians will recognize like prayer, prayer. Nowadays, you can go to any bookshop and get all these self-help books that tell you to do positive affirmation. And if you want to achieve something to repeat it over like a mantra and stuff, that's what prayer is. OK, I mean, you can take the sort of godless approach and say, I'm just saying this and that's going to help me get it. Or you can take the God is there approach and he's listening. He, she, it, they, whatever the pronoun is. Um, uh, what, at the end, it's, it's like Judaism, I think, provides you with some very, very positive ways of living. Um, getting up early to go and pray. Well, you know, that's a communal experience. It, it gives you a purpose. It starts your day early. It, it, it puts you in a frame of mind to achieve other things. And I think that it's no accident that Jews have been overachievers because we've, we've been blessed with this rule set and, and a mindset that, that if you follow it, or even if you're just cognizant of which are the good bits, um, sets you up well in life. So, so I, what I saw was that it was very hard to raise Jewish children in the UK unless you either became fully religious and ghettoized yourselves in Golders Green or the religious parts of Manchester. And, and, and that's not what I was looking for. And what Israel offered, and I could see through visiting my wife's family here, was the ability to live a Jewish life in a largely secular way. And that's that's what and and safety, you know, bizarrely enough, even though, you know, uh, another border policeman was stabbed yesterday, uh, he's he's all right. There's a feeling I get the feeling that the country is looking out for me. Yeah, it's in Europe as a whole, I think. Um, the, well, the, the, I noticed that but obviously there's been an increase in anti uh, anti semitic anti-Semitic attacks, um, a lot, obviously a lot more since Merkel allowed in millions of people, obviously from the third world, but to like, I know quite a few, I've got a few Jewish friends that live in London and they're saying to me that if Jeremy Corbyn becomes prime minister, then that would be the trigger for them to go and move over to Israel. Because you see, I mean, there's a lot of propaganda that you see, especially in London as well. I know there was a bus sign um, at one point stating that Israel was a racist state and you regularly see the protests against Israel which is frustrating at the same time as well, because they, the people that are actually protesting against it, they don't want, when they say they, you know, they want to sit, they want to free Palestine. They don't want, um, it's basically the destruction of Israel. And people, and, and I've, I've witnessed it on our could stay demonstrations. Um, and, and it's disturbing because we shouldn't have that amount of hatred in society to, to a group of people that, you know, that shouldn't be hated. And you hear a lot of story, well, a lot of people, you know, some on the far right, some on the far left that say, oh, well, Jews are overrepresented in, in this field and this field. But it's because, they, you know, you find a lot of Jewish people have a higher IQ and, that, and, and, and they work hard as well. Yeah, you know, like, I, I've read all the IQ stuff and, I, you know, I'm, by background, obviously I'm an Ashkenazi Jew. Israel is not, by any means majority Ashkenazi anymore, by the way, it's, it, it, we're, I think we're roughly 50-50 between, they're, they're sort of Sephardi, which is sort of Spanish, and we have North African Jews um, and Yemeni Jews. We've got Jews from everywhere. I mean, the colors, are, the skin colors are just totally mixed here. 
and 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 are mixing actually more in this generation and the last few generations than than most people outside realize. Anyway, the IQ thing, I I, I actually think that it's, it's it's all a combination. There's a there's a field actually a useful field called epigenetics, which takes a big, bigger picture than than just the genetic makeups. It's genetics and the culture and how they mix together. So, like I was saying, you know, this 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 tradition of prayer, tradition of learning, tradition of of putting everything into your kids to make them achieve more than you could achieve in your life. Those, all those things make us, have made us successful in all sorts of fields, except as I always point out, professional golf, we suck, and committing genocide against the Palestinians, we suck at that. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> because, because whilst we've been committing genocide, according to all these people marching on our kids, the, the population of, of Palestinians in the world has gone from 800,000 or something to six million. So that's the reverse of a genocide in most people's eyes. Um, but, and also professional golf. You know, we've never had a Jewish, you know how many Jews play golf at the weekends? Uh, it's like, it's, it's, it's lots. It's not in Israel because there's only one golf course, but outside of Israel, in America, Jews are on all the golf courses, but they're crap. <laughs> we've had one professional golfer who, made, who won a major. His name was Corey Pavin and he was Jewish. You know what happened to him? Oh he became an evangelical Christian. <laughs> I swear to you, you can't make this shit up. Anyway, we 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 do, but but that's the thing is we we overachieve on all sides. So, like I've been doing this counter jihad stuff, and that's that's how I became associated with the EDL and Tommy and so on. That's how I came to know about. Them. And within the counter jihad, much to the annoyance of these of this. The real far right, you know, because you and I are not far right. You know, the papers will call us far right. They'll call Tommy far right. They'll call anybody who isn't like Jeremy Corbyn. They'll call them far right. Yeah. The, the annoyance to them is that there are Jews in the counter jihad because Jews are actually the primary. It, oh. If anywhere in the world is threatened by jihad today, it's Israel. And we know it, and some of us know it. We've we've not always dealt with that properly because many Jews, the Jews from all the Arab lands, they were dimmies. And they were dimmies, they were oppressed by Islam for a thousand years. And that changes mindsets that is passed down through generations. Only now, I think, are the descendants of Arabic Jews coming to terms with, there, there are two different problems. One is getting off their, throwing away the shackles of dimitude. And then it's also decolonization. And what that means is the whole of the Middle East was colonized by the greatest empire the world has ever seen. Forget the British Empire, forget mm. the Roman Empire. Islam is the biggest colonial force that's ever existed. It grew from the smallest little thing, which is one man in Arabia, and it conquered vast tracts of the world. I mean, Afghan all the way out to Afghanistan and the Ugias in China. And, and then all Africa as well, was it? Because I've, I've watched a lot of uh, Bill Warner's work. Um, he's exactly. He's brilliant on this stuff. And it's, and it's, it's interesting to see, because this is, I think this is what people, people, I know, especially on the left in Britain, but they want to give us this idea that we all share this, you know, we're shared values, multiculturalism, we're all part of this, uh, this great project. But I've noticed, um, especially since 2001, I was only 12 when the... Um, um, the New York terror attack took place, but you, I never really knew about Islam before that. I don't think. I mean, my dad worked in the Middle East and he, he worked in Israel and, and whatnot, but we never really knew anything about Islam. And then since nine eleven, you had no choice but to learn about Islam and, and ultimately what the end game is. And it's not um, peace and tolerance. In the end, it's subjugation and being the dominant religion and the dominant culture, which is what I see happening. To, which is what is going to happen to England, I think. I'll tell you a little secret. Um, I, I think I've told this story on a somewhere on some podcast before, but um, I don't think I don't think Israel has ever fully come to terms with the Islamic. Not, well, no, wider Israel has not come to terms with the Islamic roots of the jihad against us. Okay, we, some people have, um, and they've been shunned at times. But I think. I think awareness is growing of what, what it is, what, like yesterday, I mean, there's just like yesterday, um, two kids run towards some border policemen, pull a knife, 
try and stab one. And they stabbed. And, and I just read this, this tiny line in, in the AP News report. A uh, policeman was wounded um, in the shoulder. OK, now, if you want to murder someone with a knife, you stab in, you stab into the body center mass. You, 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 you try and stab towards the heart or up through the rib cage, or you don't go for the neck first, okay? Because it's harder to hit. These guys always go for the neck. Why? Because it says in the Quran, smite them at the neck. It's like an instruction manual. Yeah. And, and they're, they're doing it <coughs> not just to kill. They're doing it in the Quranic way. And I had this meeting, I, I don't know when this was, 2003 or four. It was a bizarre meeting, and it's the only time I've, I've ever knowingly met someone connected with the Mossad. Okay, so this is for all the conspiracy guys out there, Mark Collette, all of you guys, Dion, whatever. This is the bit you want to take, pay attention to, okay? So I had this meeting in a coffee shop because a former, a former person who had worked there uh, and someone who was currently working there in research roles one one had left and was going to form a think tank. And I think I was being, and I, I, someone had introduced me and said, talk to this guy. And I was being interviewed for like, maybe I would do some research for a think tank. This was about 2004, something like this, yeah. not long after 9-11. So, and, and these people were researchers. They were not field agents or the, as far as I know, that's what, that they, that's what they said to me. And, and they, they felt like academics. So we got talking and I just dropped into the conversation. I said, well, you know the significance of the date 9-11, don't you? You know about the gates of Vienna. And you know, I'm pretty sure, James, that the gates of Vienna, the siege of the gates of Vienna, which is yeah, the point at which... Empire, wasn't it? It's, yeah, it's the point at which the Ottoman Empire was kind of turned back and it started the uh, freeing of Europe from, from, you know, some parts of Europe from... from you know, occupation by Islam. And I said, you know, that, that the sort of that's the historical date on which the, this, this siege uh, happened. And, and of course, you know, it's, it's fuzzy. And, but you know that. And, and then I got these, look, these blank faces looking at me. Uh -huh. And these people were like historical researchers at the Mossad. And I'm thinking, if you don't know that like basic fact, which you can get by googling and it's really not that hard it's like do you what else don't you go and they could have been gaslighting me they could have been i don't know i've never known but i just got the feeling that everybody's been trying to avoid blaming like what's in the quran and what's in the hadith and what's in the surah you know the stories of the life of muhammad for everything that goes on here and every time we do a peace conference you know, if it were me, I would have a big sign behind behind us saying, um, this is just a hood now. We've got 10 years max and then we're going to have to renegotiate because they're going to come back at us. Well, it's yeah. And this is why no um, no treaty has ever lasted, has it, with Israel? Um, because, and it wasn't it in. Um, a, well, I can't remember what the leader's name, but they said this in the White House, didn't they? When they had Bill Clinton. I read, um, I can't remember where it was. The Oslo, the, the Oslo Accords in 1993 is, yeah. okay. Now, the one that has worked so far is Egypt. Um, you know, we, we, we conquered Sinai in 67. Uh, and Sinai is a very strange part of the world because it's this just big dollop of desert that lies between Israel and Egypt. Uh, and, and, you know, one side... I think the sun is. I'm. I'm going to just move out of the sun. Okay. Uh, because, yeah. So this Sinai is this big, sunny. It's this big dollop of desert that lies between uh, Israel and Egypt. It's got the Suez Canal at one side and um, Israel at the other, and 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 it kind of elat the, the 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 desert town at the top of the Red Sea. Um, that's sort of in the corner. Now, the Sinai, it's not really clear that it actually belonged to Egypt, but we conquered it in 67. And in fact, when we conquered it, it was um, the tank commander, Ariel, Ariel Sharon, who kind of led the tanks through it. And he, he arrived at the uh, Suez Canal and he was all gung-ho. He crossed the Suez Canal, actually, and established a beachhead on the other side. And then he, he basically wanted to drive to Cairo. Uh, 
and word came back was just don't drive to Cairo. But I, you know, I mean, it was it was touch and go. He, he really wanted to drive his ready tank to Cairo, but he didn't. Anyway, we gave that back uh, with a peace agreement with Sadat, and um, that's held. Now, do I think it's held solidly? No, I think that this guy who came to power while Obama was in in, in charge was this Muslim Brotherhood guy. I think that would have been the collapse of that peace agreement. But it was only because he was deposed soon after. Yeah. You know, but we don't have peace. You don't make peace with an Islamic country. You make a temporary truce. And as long as you appear strong, they will not attack you. And they will review their strength versus your strength. And if they don't think they can get you, they'll go quiet. And that's, and that's, that's the same story we have. But I just want, I just want to stop here because... I'm going to do lots of talking on this. So you, and then uh, another point, I'm going to interview you at some point. But I just want to say this. Israel is not that important to Britain. OK, we just don't matter so much. This is the this is the whole fallacy of the world media. OK, um, this was, you know, the, 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 there was an AP journalist um, by the name of Matty Friedman. He's written books and stuff. And he, he did a big sort of coming out and expose, and he points all this stuff out. There are more journalists in Israel and covering Israel than covering the whole of Africa, huh. okay? That's a lot, isn't it, considering the vast difference between a country and a continent? Yeah, we've got, there's eight, nine million people now living here, and there's Africa, and there's no, and there are more journalists, not more journalists per capita, not more journalists per square meter, there are more journalists total in Israel at any moment than in the whole of Africa. Go check it out. You can work it out. You can check the bureau numbers. The, uh, the staffing is insane. And so the attention given, we, and the, the other example, he says it's all about the way stories are framed. It's like there was a war in 1917 going on across the whole of Europe, right? Yeah. But the, like the most unbelievable intensity of that war was going on in Belgium. Right through the middle of Belgium, there was this just colossal fucking slaughter on, on scale never before seen in human history. Why couldn't Belgium just stop it? Why couldn't Belgium just stop this horrible war going on in their territory? Like, if you just looked at Belgium, why, why was there so much war going on in Belgium? And that's the point. It's like, if you take this very narrow view and you just look at Belgium, well, they must be the world's most horrible people because there's so much slaughter going on in You've got to look at the bigger picture. And, and Sunni and Shia have been slaughtering each other for a thousand years. They're yeah. not going to stop if Israel's not here. It, it, this stuff just doesn't... We, we're not the reason for everything. But they're just using Israel as... A, I always find that... I, well, I believe that they're using Israel as a scapegoat. And then I, I noticed in the news yesterday, you know, we've seen, obviously, in going into American politics, you look at yeah. what in the Democratic Party... And they're all having a hissy fit now, aren't they? Because they're not allowed into Israel. But then they've spent their whole political careers campaigning against Israel and wanting to cause harm to Israel. Um, so I think Benjamin Netanyahu, he's played a brilliant one then. He's basically enforced Trump's policy, hasn't he? But, um, well, it's, it's not even Trump's policy. It's like Britain. Who is Britain banned? Like, Lauren Southern, um, Britain. Lauren Southern. But before then, you, you know, way back to the early days of the EDL and when I was involved, um, or not, not involved, but I was like carefully watching and helping out when I could. Uh, Robert Spencer and Pamela Geller were both banned from Britain by Theresa May as the Home Secretary. They were coming, they had been invited by Tommy Robinson to speak at an EDL event. And, you know, Theresa May banned them because their presence would not be conducive to the public good, because they would say stuff about Islam. So, you know, there's no, there's no difference. He, Wilders was banned from the UK. Uh, and he was a sitting member of the, he was like the number three guy in the, the Dutch parliament at the time. And it wasn't until he hired a very expensive barrister that he got that overturned. So countries ban people all the time. America under Obama in 2012 banned a sitting member of the Knesset, a Jewish member of the Knesset. They banned him from going to, to America. So this stuff happens. I'm, I'm all right. I, I saw the itinerary of these girls, women, sorry, uh, I mustn't be. I mustn't be. Whatever. I'll. I'll probably be arrested. 
Um, You're safe in Israel. I'm safe here, yeah, nobody cares. Um, anyway, but the, the point I was making was you, the, the British press certainly blows Israel up as to be responsible for everything. If there was peace here or if Israel disappeared and all of us Jews were suddenly... Be, there, there were two real options on the table here. Either all the Jews leave or all the Jews here become dimmies and submit to Islam. That's, that's actually what all the peace plans that the Saudis have ever proposed are. Mm. They're, they're exactly what Muhammad wrote down. They said, you become dimmies, you accept the, the contract of dimitude. You know where the word comes from? Dimmi and comes from the Arabic verb damma, which means to blame, to find fault with, to criticize. And why are we criticized? We're blamed and we're faulted because Jews falsified the Torah. Okay, this is the, this is the Islamic, uh, this is the core of Islamic doctrine. Jews falsified the Torah. God wrote the Quran, then Jews found it and said, oh, we're not in this enough. We need to cross out Muhammad and throw him away and just write it all about us. So that's how the Torah came. And then Christians took the, 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 then Christians are the people who were led astray by the Jews. This is Islamic doctrine. So first comes the Quran, then comes the Torah, then comes Christ in the New Testament. So in their prayers in the morning, in the morning, they say, uh, they curse 17 times a day. They curse those who have gone astray, that's Jews, and they curse those who have been led astray, that's you, the Christians. Because they, they put you on a lower rung because like, a lower rung of hatred, I mean. They put you on a lower rung because they like, well, these Christians didn't, they didn't falsify it themselves. They just believed the nasty Jews who did. So it's ridiculous, <laughs> isn't it? When I, um, I, I, I'm glad to mention this because well, I have to now have weekly probation meetings because I oh, use yeah. a naughty word. And when yeah, I go, that's why we've had such a tough time scheduling this because you oh, keep having to go and be do indoctrinated with cultural Marxism. Oh, it's ridiculous because she said to me, the, she told me yesterday that we have to remember that all religions are equal. Um, and we, and then she also, she also said this to me, which was very interesting. We were talk, she was talking about um, immigration and borders policies and basically saying, her view was that if you're a if you're a family, then you can go and illegally enter another country. Because she was describing what was going on at the Mexican American border, she was saying, "Well, you know, they they need to get their children there, so, but in, they shouldn't be taking their children on the on these journeys in the first place because they're unsafe." And she said, "So I said, from what I can gather, is you want laws on speech, and you want to criticise somebody for speaking." But when it comes to borders, there should be no laws at the border and you can just come in and out as you please. It's crazy that the way that they, I, I just think their brains are wired differently because they don't they don't understand our point of view. And she said that um, our, our, our points of view hurt certain communities and it, and it makes them feel uncomfortable. But it, you have to have freedom of speech, you have to be able to criticize. Uh, to criticise and offend in a society where you don't have free speech. And that's something that I don't believe we have in England anymore, free speech. Have you well. thought of giving her a copy of Muhammad's Quran? You know, with the I've highlighted... I've got one upstairs. I've got, I'm I've... sure you do. I'll um, tell you what, I'll get, I'll get Peter to send you with a, a couple more. It's like, actually, I th he's, working, he's working furiously on another version, on a, on a second... Uh, and, and I think this is going to be a... a it's, it, it's got a reworked... Um, uh, index and it's it's going to be absolutely incredible. But but listen, I know I, I I get this this mindset of not wanting to. They, firstly, I've said this and I wrote this years ago. Abrahamic religions. That phrase. Every time I hear it, my yeah. head, I, I go, I get this spider sense tingly. Is like, uh oh, what are they going to hit us with now? Because I, like I say, I'm absolutely fine with kinship with Christianity. I tour Israel, you know, when Tommy came here, uh, the first day that we were touring, which was November the 9th, 2016, the reason I can remember the date so well is because we woke up in the morning and it's like it, Trump was on the verge of winning. Yeah. And we were watching breakfast on our, and we had our phones and Trump was on the verge of winning. And then we went out to our first, our first tourist stop of the day was a, um, a fishing boat that they dug up from the sort of shore of the Sea of Galilee, what we call the Kinneret. And uh, it's this preserved fishing boat. And it's like exactly the same era as 
Peter and, and you know, it's, yeah, it's you can't say it's Peter's boat, but it's that. that and and the, the thing that gets it, and, and this is why I love talking to Christians who visited Israel. When they see that boat and then they open the Bible, you can clearly see the descriptions are right. You know, that it just matches. The way the trees are described matches. It just, this place is obviously that place. So we did all of the Christian sites and we went to a house. Again, all of this era of, of a guy called Jesus wandering around that part of Israel. And, and it, whether you believe he's the son of God or not, it doesn't matter. It's clear something happened here. Mm. And, and we, we, we share so much. You know, the, every part of Christianity when it has a similarity to Judaism, there's a good reason for it. When I look in, Cor in the Quran, I see more often than not an inversion. It's like, why do they, why do we cover, why do our women cover up? Well, they do it, they do it for themselves as a kind of a way not to provoke men, but they don't do it for self-preservation. You know, the Islamic turn it on the head and they say that, that unless the women are covered, the men will get all rapey. Well, Which is a bit, that's a bit, because um, then that's not really, well, it's obviously not talking about your men very highly, but then it goes to show the mentality of people that can't see women without their faces being covered, which I find it, that strange. It's, it's exactly that. And, and it's like, why do women, why do married women cover their hair? Well, it's just not to tempt, not to be more tempting than necessary. But but there's a full expectation that men don't get raped. That's, it's like, there's no, there's no expectation in Judaism that, that if you see uncovered meat, you can take it. That's, you know, like the, there was this, um, uh, there was this imam in Australia years ago who said that it, you know, women wearing bikinis was like meat left out and the cats would just come and take it. And, and, and it's the expression that um, Jack Straw used way back when when people were just starting to understand that the the scale of the jihad rape rape gangs and he said that it's this mentality that these girls are easy meat and anyway we're skipping around it's like why why do i care about britain i'll tell you yeah. i left there but i grew up there i'm still i'm like watching the cricket i'm like I wish I could support Australia because it would like be easier, uh, I, 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 but I can't. I just I can't. I'm, I'm, I'm we're world champions. We are, and I tell you though, though that was a disaster for me because of course my wife was insisting that we watch that nail biting and horrific tennis match because she was like emotionally scarred by Federer losing, <laughs> and and then I flicked over to see the last ball of something called a super over, and nobody had ever I'd never heard of a super over. Anyway, that was. But, but this is the point. I do have an emotional attachment. I do want to see England win in the World Cup. I am in cricket and in football. It's like I don't bear any ill will towards the general population of Britain. And I think, actually, let's, should we talk about the Nazi invasion? Yeah, let's talk about the Nazi invasion. Uh, okay. The way I see it is this. Ever since the EDL began, the press has said Tommy Robinson is a Nazi. The EDL are Nazis, they're just BNP people, and they want to create a white racist Britain. Okay, the EDL never said anything even about immigration. I know, I was, I was writing some of the stuff on the website. We didn't have a position on immigration. The EDL as an organization just didn't talk about immigration. It talked only about the effect of Islamization on the UK populations, and yep. it talked about the right to peacefully protest. Um, that, those were the things. And it wasn't about more immigration, less immigration, where they should come from. No, no word about that at all. And in fact, I think that UKIP, back before the whole Brexit thing, I think UKIP have always made a str strategic error to talk about wanting to stop immigration. What I think you should be talking about is stop immigration that does not culturally assimilate. Yeah. Okay? Uh, and, and you can, so I think, of, I think that there's too much immigration, 
but it's also where it's from. And look, to be brutally frank, only Islam is, Islam is the only culture that comes and when it's in smaller numbers, it sort of blends in a bit. All happy, uh, smiling to your face. As the numbers grow, it asserts itself. It wants halal food in the, in the hospitals, which Jews have, never, Jews have never taken over a hospital. If Jews want a school that serves kosher food, it's a Jewish school. That's it. We yeah. don't expect anybody else to eat kosher. Um, these, and, and Islam has this history of that. That's how it operates. And that's the, this is the thing that they, they don't understand about dimitude and about the takeover. Islam does not conquer by a democratic method, okay? That's never happened. Maybe it will happen somewhere in Europe. And maybe it's happening in individual cities. Well, they've got Islam, the Islamic party in Belgium, haven't they? And, and then we're, yeah. we're obviously okay. starting to see a lot more Muslim MPs in Britain, which I think is, I, I think the way that they will probably, in the end, if it, if it does happen, the complete Islamization of Britain will be through, will be through the ballot box. I, I can see how that's progressing. But just remember... Islam has nearly always conquered when it was a minority. And then the minority rules the majority. And success in the Islamic conquest of everywhere has always come that the successful periods of their history have always come when there was a small Islamic minority ruling a large dimmy, min a, a dimmy majority. Yeah. And then Islam leeches the achievements of the dimmy uh, majority. And then over time, the conditions of being a dimmy are so horrible that they either leave or they become Muslim. And then Islam, the Islamic society collapses because you become all chiefs and no, you know, you know, all chiefs and no Indians. Nobody's doing the work. Nobody's being productive. And, and their society collapses because it's a, it's a poor way to organize society. It's very good for the invasion. It's very bad for long-term sustainability. That's what's happening. And, and so the EDL started off talking about this kind of stuff. But the press was so busy telling everybody they were the new far right, the new far right, that the, that the real, and they are a very small minority of these, what today are these ethno-nationalists, sort of Mark Collette's the most eloquent. Um, they want to, to join. And at every turn, every time Tommy went to prison, they'd rise up. And every time he came out, he'd punch one and tell them to bugger off. Same thing has happened this time. And I don't believe, I don't believe that Britain is a fundamentally, these days, a fundamentally racist society. Okay? No. I, I actually think there's lots of people who are, who've got mixed families now. This cousin's married that, that woman from this Hindu woman or black. And there's, there's like, I don't think, and, and anyway, the country's still mostly white. I, but I just don't, I don't think that there's this horrific ethno-nationalism uh, that's like so strong, you must only see white faces. But then, you know, I watched Channel 4 last night, news just that I happened to. And I mean, it's ridiculous. It's just, it's just diversity, 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 bang your head into it. And that does make people sick. And yeah. that does make people angry. And that drives people, that is creating this, this real far right. And then they try and infuse... An organization, you know, Tommy is not racist. I don't think you're racist. I don't think most of the people are racist. Now, if unfortunately you're exposed to the same protocols of the elders of Zion, kind of these, these hundred plus year old stories that Jews are overrepresented in everywhere. And, the, and the, you know, the internet's done a great job on that. There's YouTube yeah. videos coming out of your ears, you know, Europa, the stuff that Dion says and... I fear for that. I don't think that numerically those people are really, really strong. They do get people all the time and, and they're very loud online. But I don't think, I, I still worry much more about the Islamic threat. Yeah, because I think that's the, for, like, I've had uh, numerous discussions with people like, that are supposed, well, I'd say right, far right. And see, my, my biggest concern is the Islamization and, and Brexit being ignored. And then, you know, we, we are, because I often, you often hear this conspiracy theory. It's basically like all the Jews, they run the world and they're in control of everything. 
And I often think to myself, I sit there sometimes and I think, is, do you know, is, have we seen a big Islamic leftist conspiracy theory come out and come into play? Because it surely, if, you know, if Jews did really run the world, then you wouldn't see the amount of anti-Semitism there is. But the United Nations, they, they treat Israel a lot more friendly, which they don't do. Um, and it, it's just, like I say, it's interesting to see because we share the Judeo-Christian values of what built the West and what made the West the greatest civilization. So I don't understand people um, that like that are against Israel. I mean, you can like criticize, yeah, you can criticize a government or a state, but for one, to... but the value systems and like you've said, I've heard you say, it, look, what Europe is lacking is a Christian value system, and they've tried to replace it with this, and it's deliberate, and and I think. You know, what the Soviet Union set up, this Marxist propaganda, which Corbyn represents the, the, the sort of Corbyn represents the, the pinnacle achievement of the old Soviet propaganda into Britain, which was absolutely true. And Soviet propaganda, I'm convinced, created the Palestinian narrative that I deal with. It created CND in Europe. It created everything that Corbyn now represents. That was Soviet propaganda. And I don't think when, when the Soviet Union fell, I don't, think that, I don't think that went away because I think it was already in Europe. In fact, I used to be interviewed sometimes on I-24 News, which is this Israeli 24-hour news station. I was, I was like their go-to pro-Brexit guy during Brexit. But the last time I was on was a year after Brexit. And I went on and I said that the EU was founded by former Nazis and former communists. Which is and true. That's absolutely. That's not... You know, that's not conspiracy theory. Now, were there some Jews? Probably. I, you know, there are some Jews. And, you know, what, what's that thing they always come with? Uh, I can't even remember the name. Um, the, the, uh, the, 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 I'll remember it later. <laughs> and and Batyor, who is a Jew, who I know, um, she wrote the book on Dimitude. And she also wrote the book Eurabia. And in fact, I remember one of the things as I was close to leaving the UK, I don't know, this must have been 2006 or seven. The Economist ran a full edition and on the cover was just the one word, Eurabia, and a picture of, uh, a, was it a minaret with the, I, I, it was just a minaret or something. Anyway, and, and it just said Eurabia, question mark. And they wrote this whole edition. They didn't mention Bat Yor, whose book, Eurabia, had just come out. And they wrote this whole edition to just rubbish the theory of Eurabia, which is that there is some kind of tie-up that, that European nations did with North Africa, with Libya, with, with all of these nations to bring in Muslims from the, the, the Middle East to pay for your pensions. Because, you know, the European pension and health system is basically a Ponzi scheme. And, and you've stopped having babies, so you've got no more babies to to, to work to pay for your things so they brought in instead of bringing what they should have brought in is hong kong chinese or they should have brought in koreans or something because their value systems would have aligned somewhat and they would have worked whereas you brought in these people who are just drug dealers and um well and I, I spoke to um my friend's girlfriend she was over from germany um yeah weeks ago and i was having a discussion with her and um, she's quite liberal left really liberal left and I was saying to her, I said, so what do you make of, you know, Merkel when she decided to invite millions of people in? And she said that her response was, if we hadn't have let them in, they'd have called us Nazis again. So and I said to her, I said, so hold on. The, the, so the idea is that, you know, what Nazi Germany did to the Jews in the Holocaust was absolutely disgusting and abhorrent. And for that, you're now going to bring in millions of people yeah. that have the exact same feeling towards these people so that you're not called Nazis. It's like we're, we're in an alternative reality sometimes. It doesn't make sense. It, it's, None of it makes sense. It's and straight. I, I, Merkel's not Jewish and most of the German politicians are not Jewish. I, I just... Where they get the idea that somewhere behind the scenes there are Jews pulling the strings for Zionism, which, you know, and I said this on the, the last like thing I recorded, Zionism is quite simple, really. Zionism was a political movement to establish the state of Israel. Yeah. We did it. We got the state of Israel. We, 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 we got a Balfour Declaration, but that wasn't what gave us Israel, because then the British took Israel away, essentially, with a white paper that kept Jews out when they could have saved lots of Jews during... Yeah, the Holocaust. they weren't letting them in, were they? No, and then, and then, and then, and this is really interesting because this speaks to the other part of, you know, I call myself an indigenous Jew. 
uh, an, in, an indigenous rights activist. I do that to wind up the, 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 the left, the social justice warriors. And, you know, I have my pronouns, doctor, sir. Um, <laughs> the, the, what happened in 1948 was that Jews were just, Jews were going to get Israel, okay? You couldn't, nobody could stop us because we, we had suffered something that most nations, most people, most tribes cannot comprehend. And, and we were going to take back Israel. And the British Empire was waning. They were being fought in India. They, you know, they, there, was, there, were, there were liberation movements going on. They handed Jordan, they created this Hashemite kingdom, handed it to a king that, you know, just, that was just a negotiation. Boom. Jordan, the whole of Jordan was supposed to be part of an Israel. Okay, gave that to But what we did was we fought the correct war to expel a colonial occupier. And there's no doubt Britain was a colonial occupier of Israel. So we fought the correct war. We blew up some soldiers. You know, we had our soldiers killed. It was a proper rebellion against the colonial occupying force. The argument that I always hear um, from King people, David, oh, King right, David. You know, is about the British soldiers that were, uh, that were yeah. there. But then, but then, like I said, you know, in times of war, these things do happen. And since then, it's like, I, I don't understand why Britain has such a, and the British government have such a cold stance towards it. Here's, here's the question, <laughs> you know, that the far right that I asked them is like, they always say, what about the, you know, if they're British, they say, what about the King David? If they're American, they say, what about the Liberty, the, the, the USS Liberty, which was the ship that was uh, sunk, um, uh, some say by accident, some say on purpose, whatever. I, the, the point is, these people only know about Jews killing British soldiers. I guarantee you, all over the British Empire, during this era, British soldiers were being killed by natives everywhere. The yeah. only action they know about is the King David bombing. The King David was a hotel, but it was requisitioned as the headquarters of the British army in Jerusalem. So it was not a hotel. I mean, you call it the King David Hotel, but it had been turned into a military headquarters. And there's all sorts of stuff about a warning that was phoned in, but they didn't believe it. And whatever, it's history. Um, it's not something, and it's not even something that, that we celebrate in, in, you know, some celebrate, most don't. You know, it was a very controversial thing when it happened actually because but then what happened was in 1948 actually at the inception when when israel declared independence it was when exactly when the british pulled out was when the so, arabs came to attack and war. then the arabs declared war and the arabs came in with much better weaponry but that they'd got often from the british and from other sources um and we fought an actual proper freaking fighting war about eight kilometers that way is jaffa uh, nine, well, maybe, yeah, it's not even. And between Jaffa and Tel Aviv, they're, they're joined now. You know, they've grown into each other. But there was like a sea, there was like a, a war, a, a, a battle line. And if you walk there, there's, there was a mosque. They were shooting you on the streets. If, you know, that area was a dead man zone. And the, the, this is, there was an actual battle going on, you know, for a year and a half. And Jerusalem was a battleground. We lost half of it because we couldn't afford... We couldn't afford the manpower and we didn't have the right weapons to keep it. And we couldn't resupply it. It was cut off. Um, but, but when that war ended uh, and we had established ourselves, that's what we did. We, we fought the correct war to get out of colonial occupier. What the Arabs are fighting today is the correct war to get a colonial occupier off your land. The only problem is, and the only reason it will never work, is we're not a colonial occupier. So you'll stab us. And you'll inflict the kind of damage that if you were Britain in Israel or France in Algeria or the Afghanistan or the Russians in Afghanistan, you, you do these kind of terrorist type small attacks and eventually people get sick of seeing body bags come home. And yeah. believe me, we don't like watching body bags or burying our sons. But the difference is we're here. We, this is our land. We feel a connection to it. So they keep fighting the wrong war. They're fighting the, the war to get a colonial occupier out. Now, I know we're back on Israel because I've got to put this stuff across. I, 
I don't, I don't like lecturing the British about Israel. I just don't. But what you get in your press is such bullshit. Yeah, well, the whole, the whole of the British press is a complete utter lie. I found that out in January this year when they printed lie after lie about me. Um, and then they also brought my family into it as well, releasing where my mum went to work and stuff like that, which was yeah. absolutely disgraceful. I mean, what's happened to you is a microcosm of what happens to Israel. On a, you know, on a, on a countrywide scale. And the same with Tommy. I mean, just Tommy's just been at the peak of this for, for years. The, you know, the, the level, I mean, you, I, I listen, I, I think you did the right thing not going to prison for what you said. I, I, I don't think anybody would have gained. I don't think you would have gained. I don't think the country would have gained. Uh, look, I, I'll give you a slight criticism because I'll be remiss if I don't. Obviously, calling her a Nazi is a problem because it, devalues not the comparison to Nazi. I yeah. hate comparisons of Trump to Nazis because because of this. Because Trump ain't gonna start slaughtering people. Anna Subri definitely isn't gonna start slaughter. But she wants to bring in a fascist state that controls what you think, controls what you say, controls what you read. And those are the steps that fascist dictators take. And I don't think Anna Subri right now or anybody in the kind of even Corbyn, I don't think they're lining up to actually commit genocide. Hitler no. was very special. You have to you have to have read Mein Camp or at least Winston Churchill's summary of it to see that this guy was so you, you know, the signs were there. And and like I said this right back back before Trump was elected, when he was during the campaign, I wrote a blog post on Israeli cool. Uh, I said, look, let's let's compare Mein Kampf with the art of the deal. You know, you want to call Trump Hitler? Let's see. Can we find anything in the art of the deal that equates to, you know, man is a fighting animal. Uh, any, any nation that does not keep fighting will die. Jews are passive. You know, that's what's in Mein Kampf. That's not in the art of the deal. The art of the deal is be prepared to walk away from every negotiation. This is not the same stuff. I, I mean, I love, I love Trump. It was, I remember seeing, well, obviously watching the election, uh, the build up to the election in 2016. And it was amazing, wasn't it? Because the, everybody, they gave him no chance. All the mainstream media, I always had a slight feeling. I thought he'd do it. And then um, just seeing the reaction from the mainstream media, they went into complete meltdown and then fabricated this whole Russian conspiracy. For, and why aren't we seeing people being put in jail over this? I hope that it's coming. Look, I keep watching the same, you know, I'm watching the same alternative sources that you are probably. And, you know, everybody says any day now, any day now, Will Barr is going to do it. But I hope so, because I think it's actually very important. Like you and Tommy and based Amy, all of, the, you know, these are these are miscarriages of justice that are leading a lot of people to distrust the justice system in the UK. In America, it's the same. It's like this, they can hammer Trump for two years. He's the bloody president. I know. And, and nobody's going to prison for it yet. And uh, if they don't put this right, it, it leaves us, Chris, we'll wrap this up quite soon because I think my phone will run out of battery and I really hope this has been recording properly. <laughs> it says recording on here. Um, I know. But we, look, what is Judaism? As far as I'm concerned, Jew what Jews gave the world is the law. And not just the, not just the, the basis of law, of the Jewish law, is everyone is created in the image of God and everyone is created equal. And the way that the commandments, the Ten Commandments, or the, the, the way they're, they're, set, they're structured is that a lot of Jewish rabbis say you should read them not one to ten, but one, six, two, um, two, seven. And then, then the order gets a bit murky and stuff. But one and six are thou sh honor the honor the, the Lord like God. Is There's one God and, and honor him. Yeah. And number six is thou shalt not murder. And Dennis Prager does a great bit on this. Those two are together. Um, and what, what they... What they lead to is that everybody is created in the image of God. Uh, everybody is equal. And that, that includes slavery. That's why Jews, what, what we, we didn't abolish slavery one day. We had slaves. They're, they're, all the rules of how Jews keep slaves are in the Torah. 
But we just legislated it away. We made it increasingly ridiculous to hold slaves, such that it just became easier to employ people on a sort of fair basis. Yeah. And this rule of law works because all men are created in the image, all men and women and trans are created in the image of God. And you've got to honor God as the highest thing. If you kill a man, it's killing God. That's the basis of Western civilizational law. And what we're seeing today is a different law for Clinton and a different law for Trump and a different law for you and a different law for the Al-Qaeda and the Hezbollah marches on the Al-Quds Day. And that undermines every aspect of Western civilization. We've also got, um, I, I just forgot to mention this earlier on in the stream, um, it's relevant as well, with Jada's actually back in court in September, um, so hopefully she'll avoid, she'll avoid going back to prison um, in September. But yeah, she's being dragged through the system again, which is a complete disgrace. But that woman's absolutely fearless. Um, she, she's done some brilliant work over the years. Well, you know, it's I, I'm, I, I, I can't see the West saving itself unless it rediscovers the ethics of Christianity. Um, doesn't mean you all have to become like hardcore Christians, but stop denigrating what Christian roots gave Western civilization. Stop, you know. Stop being rude about churches. Stop converting them into mosques. And pubs as well and nightclubs. It's it's an insult. There's so many places up north as well. Um, in York, there's a, there was a big church that was converted into a nightclub as well. And it, it's horrible to see, really, because this is a part of our a part of our heritage. And then in um, there's a place just down the road in Manchester. There's currently, I think, an application got in the Grade Two listed building, and they're trying to convert it into a mosque. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really terrifying to see. Anyway, uh, listen, I think at some point I want to turn around and uh, I'll talk to you. I'm going away for a couple of weeks, but when, when I get back, yeah. I want to ask you about you. Uh, but this has been you talking to me. Yeah. Um, and let's, let's close it down and, uh, until the next time. Yeah, well, thank you for joining me, Brian. I've really enjoyed this as well because I've wanted to speak to you for a while. And hopefully this will have recorded properly and I can get it edited and sent over to you and then you can release it as well. Oh, well yeah, we'll put it on 3Speak. Um, yeah. That's, yeah, I'm 3Speak. I'm talking with the guy. I like 3Speak. I think we're going in a good direction. With I love 3Speak. <laughs> and um, so this will go. And, and I think you should cut this up and put it out in two or three parts because it's quite long now. And yeah. Um, and, yeah, we'll, we'll both double post it. And anyway, you go. Good you luck, go England. Go. Good luck for the Ashes. And uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> at least the twelfth man in the form of the weather seems to be playing his part this time. <laughs> well, you take care, Brian, and thank you for uh, coming on. I've enjoyed All it. All right, shabbat shalom, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.